Hello, my spooky crew, and welcome back to my channel, or welcome to my channel if this is your first time here. My name is Alex, and thanks for coming to my spooky corner of the internet. Fun fact, this is the third time I have recorded this video. Yes, third time. First time I recorded the video, the file was corrupt. Second time I recorded the video, my computer crashed, and once again, the file was corrupt. So third time's a charm, let's hope this sticks. So the topic at hand, Edinburgh Castle. Now, Edinburgh Castle is probably one of the most fascinating reportedly haunted places probably in the world and this is because not only is the site itself old the castle itself is old but it seems to have gathered many different kinds of ghost stories throughout its history and some of it's a bit debated and a lot of it does line up with historical fact so it's a little bit interesting because also Edinburgh Castle was investigated by scientists and may or may not have been confirmed as haunted. So how this video is gonna be broken down is I'm gonna go over the history and I'm going to insert the ghost stories in terms of, you know, its historical timeline, where it makes sense. And then I'll close it off with some more ghost stories towards the end that maybe doesn't have a specific time period. And then I'm gonna talk about the scientific experiment that happened in Edinburgh Castle and Mary King's Close, but we'll see how much time I have at the end and see if I can get into Mary King's Close because that one is a little bit more complicated in terms of history, fact, and myth. And if not, if I don't get to Mary King's Close this time, I will definitely get into it in a future video. But before we get started, be sure to click on that subscribe button, give this video a like, and be sure to click on that notification bell so you'll be the first to know when I upload a new video. Also, you can check out some spooky books, spooky buttons, spooky shirts, spooky sweatshirts, spooky notebooks at my Etsy shop at thespookystuff.etsy.com. And if you love the spooky stuff and want to become a spooky stuff super fan, ooh, that's a hard one to say, you can join my Patreon. Starting at just $3 per month, you'll get a behind the scenes look at the spooky stuff projects I'm working on. I promise I am going to start uploading excerpts of my book for you to take a look at before the editor gets to it, so it might be a little messy. Uh, but also, so depending on what tier you sign up for, I send certain Patreon subscribers copies of my book during the wintertime each year. So if you want to get on board with my Patreon, go to patreon.com forward slash the spooky stuff. And of course, for more ghost hunting tips, spooky stories, and just paranormal thoughts in general, you can head on over to my website at thespookystuff.com. All right, let's get started. Edinburgh Castle. It is one of the most besieged castles in the United Kingdom. It's been fought over at least 23 times. It's one of the oldest places in Europe, and it has changed hands several times between Scottish clans, English kings, and even German airships. And it's considered to be one of the greatest fortresses ever built. Despite the fact that I studied abroad in Oxford in 2007, who that was a long time ago, um, I never made it over to Scotland. So uh, shame on me. And what's interesting about Edinburgh Castle is that there is still a working military garrison. And this has been an attractive place for some sort of military occupation for literally thousands of years. Now, the rock that Edinburgh Castle sits on is known as Castle Rock, and it is over 350 million years old. It was essentially made out of volcanic rock. I believe it was granite. And it's believed that people occupied the rock as early as the Iron Age. So we're talking ancient man here. And I've also seen the Bronze Age too, but Edinburgh Castle's uh, official website says Iron Age, so I'm gonna lean on that. And about 1400 years ago, it is believed that there was some sort of fortress on Castle Rock, uh, known, or at least the area was known as Aden, which is Edinburgh. And one of the first buildings that was constructed on Castle Rock was a chapel that was built in honor of Queen Margaret, who was later made into a saint. Uh, this chapel was built by King David, King David I. And the chapel is now known as St. Margaret's Chapel. And then research shows that around 1103, that was when King David constructed the rest of Edinburgh Castle. Now, the way that Edinburgh Castle was constructed, what we have today wasn't what was built back in 1103 or in the 12th century. So in this period of time, Edinburgh Castle was a royal residence. So we mentioned Queen Margaret, St. Margaret. Uh, she was married to Malcolm III. Now she passed away tragically after Malcolm, her husband, and her eldest son were 
killed in battle. And she did have three surviving sons, and each of them ended up ruling over Scotland at some point. Now, Edinburgh Castle has been the center of hostility for centuries. Literally became the site of death, surprise attacks... Now, in 1296, Edward I of England, who was also known as Hammer of the Scots, ended up taking over. He captured Edinburgh Castle. And so the English won Edinburgh Castle for about 18 years. And then in 1314, Thomas Randolph, also known as the Earl of Moray, took back control of Edinburgh Castle. Uh, what was interesting was the way that he did it was he got a tip of how to how to climb the the rock wall, the you know the rock that Edinburgh Castle sits on, from a gentleman who climbed the wall and the rock each night so he could visit his lady in the town. By the way, that adulterous gentleman that knew how to climb the wall and the rock to Edinburgh Castle was named William Francis. So given Edinburgh Castle's location, it became a prime spot for the English to take over. And not just the English, but other Scottish clans. They wanted Edinburgh Castle. The Earl of Moray and his men slaughtered the English that were on Edinburgh Castle and essentially take it back. And then Robert the Bruce comes in afterwards and demolishes Edinburgh Castle, but... In 1335, English forces recapture the ruins of Edinburgh Castle because, hey, that's prime real estate. And then in 1341, Sir William Douglas uh, recaptures Edinburgh Castle for Scotland. Hooray! So less than 100 years since the Earl of Moray took back Edinburgh Castle for Scotland, uh, the Stuarts took over the Scottish throne. And at this stage, when the Stuarts took over, Edinburgh Castle sort of became like this Game of Thrones type of situation. So in 1437, James I was murdered. I believe he was actually assassinated in a sewer tunnel. So at the time that James I passed away, James II took over the throne. But here's the deal. James II was only six years old. So regency over James II was given to a man named Archibald Douglas, who was the fifth Earl of Douglas. And then after Archibald Douglas passed away, James II was put under the care of two men, their names were William Crichton, First Lord of Crichton, and Lord Chancellor of Scotland, Sir Alexander Livingston of Callender. And actually, and James Douglas was part of that as well, uh, who was the Earl of Avondale. But we're going to focus on Crichton and Livingston. Now, here's the thing about the Stuarts and the Douglases. The Stuarts and the Douglases didn't necessarily get along. But at this time, James I had actually made friends with two... Douglases. We had the late Archibald Douglas's family. There was um, 16-year-old William Douglas, who was the sixth Earl of Douglas, and his younger brother. So we're talking about kids, 16 years old and younger. And Crichton and Livingston saw the two Douglas boys as threats. So they invited the two Douglas boys over for dinner, and they're feasting, they're with James II, and the head of a black bull was placed on the dinner table while they were eating. And this was a, this was a sign of death. It was a bad omen. And so the two Douglas boys are taken up by Crichton and Livingston. They're taken outside of Edinburgh Castle. They're put through this sham trial with false accusations of conspiracy, and they end up getting beheaded at Edinburgh Castle. Fun fact, when the two Douglas boys were invited over the dinner, this event ended up being called the Black Dinner, which inspired the Red Wedding for Game of Thrones. And even though James II was exposed to some horrific things, he grew up falling in love with war. In fact, he loved cannons and gunpowder. And one of the most uh, powerful cannons in the world, Mons Meg, was gifted to James II. And if we look at Scottish history, once gunpowder starts being used, it changes the world. So James II is obsessed with the latest gun tech, and then sadly in 1460, he loses his life after a cannon backfires. And he was just 29 years old. So then James III takes the throne. Enter Henry VIII, King Henry VIII. Yes, the same Henry VIII with the six wives, Anne Boleyn and all that fun stuff. So James IV was married to Henry's sister, Margaret. And so this was supposed to be the Stuarts and the, and the Tudors coming together. Um, unfortunately, James IV and Henry were bitter rivals. So James IV loses his life in 1513. His son, James V, becomes king at just 17 months old, but he eventually comes into the throne. So James V marries a woman named Marie de Guise. And if I mispronounce her name, je suis désolé, I speak French, I should know better, but yeah. <laughs> so anyway, James V becomes king. So James V is really where we start to get to the meaty ghost stories. Now, remember, the Stuarts and the Douglases do not like each other. 
So James V of Scotland had a stepfather by the name of Archibald Douglas. So after James IV lost his life, Margaret, King Henry VIII's sister, married Archibald Douglas. Now, Archibald Douglas had a sister by the name of Janet Douglas. She's also known as Lady Glamis. Now, James V was a bit petty. Now, granted, Archibald Douglas was a bit of a jerk to James V and had James imprisoned. So James essentially took this out on Janet, Lady Glamis. So after James had broken free from Archibald Douglas's um, imprisonment, he, like I said, he took it out on Lady Janet and he had Janet summoned to court. And she was accused of treason. She was accused of witchcraft. She was also accused of conspiring against the king via poisoning. And she was accused of poisoning her first husband. However, the poisoning of her husband, that was dropped and she was free to marry her second husband. But she was accused of conspiring to poison the king and communicating with her brothers, who again, do not get along with James. Now, what was sad was Janet's family and servants, they were tortured to the point where they would have said anything. They just wanted the pain to stop. So basically, they confirmed all of the conspiracy accusations, the witchcraft accusations, because they were being tortured. So Janet was put in a very dark cell for a long period of time, and legend says that she was in there for so long that she actually lost her sight. And while she was in this very very dark dungeon, she could hear workers building the scaffold that would eventually take her life. And on July 17th, 1537, Lady Janet of Glamis was burned at the stake. Now, one of the ghosts that is sighted at Edinburgh Castle is known as the Grey Lady. She is dressed like a 16th century noblewoman, and she has been spotted around the older parts of the castle. Sometimes she is seen wandering, sometimes she is seen crying. I mean, and given Janet's history, it wouldn't be surprised if the Grey Lady was Janet. However, there is also a theory that the Grey Lady could be someone else. And again, this goes back to James V. Remember Marie de Guise, who was married to James V? So James V, as we talked about, died in 1542. But Marie de Guise died in 1560. So James V was the, was the father of Mary, Queen of Scots. And at the time when James V passed away, Mary, Queen of Scots, was just six days old. Here's an important note here. As we talk about Marie de Guise and Mary, Queen of Scots, Marie was Catholic. She was on the wrong side of Catholic Reformation, and we'll get into that in a moment. Essentially, what happened was after James V died and six-day-old Mary, Queen of Scots, was, was essentially born, um, King Henry VIII orders the marriage of Mary, Queen of Scots, six days old, to Henry's only son, Edward. And the Scots were not having it. And this started the period known as the rough wooing. By the way, I'm looking at my notes. <laughs> so Henry's troops nearly destroyed Edinburgh, especially in 1544. And baby Mary is set off, sent off to France. And so, but at, the, at this time, Marie de Guise, she died in 1560, again, on the wrong side of Scottish Reformation. So Protestantism is happening here. And Marie was... Catholic. So instead of sending her corpse off to France to have a proper burial, her body was actually kept in Edinburgh Castle for months. She, her body was basically wrapped in a cloth and she was put in a lead coffin to prevent any smells from coming through. But yeah, her body was just kind of discarded and put aside for months. And then finally, her remains were allowed to go back to France. So there is a theory that the Grey Lady could be Marie de Guise. So the Grey Lady could be Lady Janet of Glamis or Marie de Guise. Now, given how much time Marie spent at Edinburgh Castle and she loved the location, I can only imagine she may have felt a bit disrespected to have her body discarded like that for several months. So in the meantime, we're talking about Mary, Queen of Scots now. Well, six-day-old Mary, Queen of Scots, Henry VIII wanted the baby to marry his son Edward. She is sent off to France to basically go in hiding and be protected. Mary, Queen of Scots, marries a French heir uh, who was the son of Catherine de' Medici, and that husband dies. And so Mary, Queen of Scots, you know, was basically told by Catherine that, hey, you're not welcomed in France anymore. Get out of here. So she goes back to Scotland. Uh, so Mary did not have a totally welcoming reception. Remember, Scotland was now basically a Protestant country. Mary was Catholic, so there was already some like, we don't know if we, we can trust you. So in 1565, Mary, Queen of Scots, marries her half-cousin, Henry Stuart, who was also known as Lord Darnley. Uh, now, Henry wasn't the most uh, 
upright husband. He liked to chase women. Um, he drank a lot. Uh, but that didn't stop from Mary from getting pregnant in 1566. And Lord Darnley claimed that the baby wasn't his, and so Mary, Queen of Scots, ends up holding up in Edinburgh Castle where she gave birth. So we've had lots of unalivings and lives ending at Edinburgh Castle, and now we have the entrance of a new life. And so she gives birth to a baby boy who ends up becoming James VI, and not too long after, Lord Darnley is found murdered. He is found naked in a yard of a house nearby. Basically, this incited a civil war in Scotland because people suspected Mary of being involved in the ending of her husband's life. So essentially, basically what happened was Mary was forced to abdicate in 1568. She fled to England in hopes that her cousin, Elizabeth I, would be able to help her out. Uh, and in Mary's absence, her son took over the throne. But, you know, he was still pretty young. Uh, but essentially, uh, her son got a Protestant education. And essentially what happened was he was able to be molded into this ideal um, Protestant king. And so there was a little bit of a civil war happening between Mary, Queen of Scots, and her son, James, who was still just a little lad. I mean, if you look it up in history, Mary, Queen of Scots, became an English prisoner. She was executed and beheaded in, in England uh, because it was believed that she was conspiring against Elizabeth I. And so as we get into the 17th century, the 17th century signaled a time when Edinburgh Castle was really no longer primarily a royal residence, but instead it turned into a place to hold court, hold prisoners of war, became military barracks. And don't get me wrong, there were like prisons or cells in Edinburgh Castle because hello, Lady Janet, uh, but it was no longer a place where the royals would spend time. I mean, Edinburgh Castle held like, I think about 800 to 1,000 prisoners at a time. Um, a lot of them came from the Napoleonic Wars. Um, there were even Americans that were imprisoned at Edinburgh and Castle during, you know, the, the American Revolution. Technically, they weren't seen as Americans, but they were seen as traitors to the crown. And so the castle essentially became a jail. And here's where this next ghost story comes in. So there was, there is legend that there was a man who was imprisoned at Edinburgh Castle and he came up with this plot to escape. What he planned on doing was he was going to go into a wheelbarrow. Wheelbarrow? Wheelbarrow? Wheelbarrow. Oh Lord, this is going to be hard to say. So his plan was he was going to go into a wheelbarrow that was full of manure and dung. And he was planning for this cart, I'm going to say cart, uh, to be taken to a nearby farm and dumped and then he could get out and escape. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. So when this prisoner went into the wheelbarrow full of poop, instead of it being transported to a farm, this cart was dumped over the side of Edinburgh Castle, you know, which has a lot of rock. It is pretty high. It's essentially a cliff. That cart got dumped and that prisoner inside the pile of manure fell out of the cart and he fell to his demise. And today when tourists go to that area, they say, they claim that they feel like they're being pushed off the ledge and they get a strong smell of manure. I mean, I can't imagine that being my afterlife if that's how I went every time, uh, People went to the place where I lost my life. They smell poop. So in the 20th century, Edinburgh Castle was still active in terms of like military fortresses and everything. Um, this was also signaling a time in new technology for war. Um, in this case, we're talking about air bombings and zeppelins. Uh, on April 2nd, 1916, Edinburgh Castle was on the receiving end of the first air raid in Scotland. Uh, 24 bombs were dropped. Amazingly enough, Edinburgh Castle did okay. It wasn't completely destroyed, which tells you how strong and sturdy this place was. Now, I did forget one story, and this was back in 1650. Now, this is a now this ghost story in particular is really fascinating because it supposedly only happened once. This ghost was only sighted once in 1650 and then never seen or heard from again. But the impact of this ghost's uh, appearance clearly was severe. And this would have happened while Oliver Cromwell's men were laying siege to the castle. There was the headless ghost of a little drummer boy that was seen. And it's believed that whenever this, that if this ghost was seen, then that means the castle must be in trouble. Now, granted, after 1650, I mean, things sort of calmed down at Edinburgh Castle. I mean, we have the governor's house that was built. 
Um, barracks are built. Mons Meg Cannon goes back to Edinburgh Castle. There's a military prison built in 1842. I mean, there was the Jacobite uprising in 1745, but even then, I don't think the headless drummer boy was seen. So essentially, this headless drummer boy appeared when Oliver Cromwell was about to attack the castle. Now, this next ghost story is quite sad, and there was a new underground tunnel found around Edinburgh Castle, assuming that it may have been used for a siege. And basically... Scotland wanted to track this tunnel to see where it went. So what they did was they sent this bagpiper uh, through the tunnel. And so the bagpiper would play, the piper would play, and the men, there would be men ab above ground following the tracks of the tunnel by listening to the bagpipes. But then all of a sudden, the bagpipes stopped. This was, and the path he was following apparently was like along the Royal Mile towards Holyrood Place, and Holyrood actually became the new residence of the royals after Edinburgh Castle. But anyway, so about halfway to Holyrood Palace, the bagpipe playing stops, and then a rescue party go, in, go into the tunnels to try to find this piper, but he is never seen again. Like, they cannot find any trace of him, which is chilling. And so, apparently, the tunnel was resealed to prevent anyone else from disappearing. And the ghost story that goes with this is, depending on where you are on the Royal Mile, you can hear bagpipes being played as if the player, the piper, is underground. Mm, that one gives me chills. And finally, this one is animal-related. There is a ghost dog that is believed to have been seen it's a black dog or a white dog depending on where you look it up because edinburgh castle does have a pet cemetery and uh, a ghost dog has been seen which is kind of sweet all right now let's talk about the science experiment now this is something that did happen it happened from april 6th to april 17th in 2001 and this was during the Edinburgh International Science Festival, and it was Dr. Weissman from the University of Hertfordshire. He conducted one of, you could say he conducted one of the largest paranormal investigations in the world. So he had nine people on his team and he interviewed and vetted hundreds of people to see what they knew about Edinburgh Castle and um, their their beliefs in the paranormal and their experiences with the, with the paranormal, if they had any. And they ended up with, I. I see numbers between 200 and 240, but they ended up with about two, over 200 participants. So beforehand, Dr. Weissman and his team did go into Edinburgh Castle and Mary King's Close. They were measuring air temperature, air movement, light levels outside of the vaults and magnetic fields. So he was doing baseline readings. And so for 10 days, Dr. Weissman and his team took the participants into small groups and they did tours around the vaults and the tunnels of the castle and Mary King's Close, but we'll have to cover Mary King's Close in another bill, in another video. Now, some of the activities that took place during these tours kind of reminded me of um, reality show challenges, I'm not gonna lie, because some of the participants were locked in vaults by themselves so that they could be observed without being influenced by other people in their party. And the participants that were locked in the vaults, um, they were reporting like hearing heavy breathing that would get closer to them. They also felt the sensation of their faces being touched. They saw lights flashing, they heard voices, they felt their clothes being tugged, they were seeing shadowy figures, and they felt the sensation of being burned. And what was weird was one group of participants reported seeing a man floating through the halls. Like, literally, he was gliding. And they said that the man was wearing old-fashioned clothing and he was wearing a leather apron. And when I say old-fashioned clothes, I'm meaning like 15th, 16th century. So maybe this was a memory that they were seeing from Lady Janet of Glamis. I don't know, but I thought that was interesting. Now, what was really good about this experiment with Dr. Weissman is he did not tell the participants where the haunted hotspots were or where there was a lot of activity reported. And what's interesting is, is, is that 51% of the participants did report having an experience in a haunted hotspot, while 35% of the participants reported having experiences in areas that were not considered hotspots. Now for me, you know, when it comes to a haunting, I feel like, you know, there are hotspots, but just because there are hot spots. It doesn't mean that hauntings and experiences can't happen in other areas. And this is what Dr. Weissman said about the experiment. What was interesting for us was whether or not these those experiences would stack up in the vaults with the reputation for being haunted. And the answer is that 
that definitely does happen. So Dr. Weissman and his team did keep into consideration like, you know, the tunnels, you know, they're enclosed, they can probably cause some anxiety. And also with the vaults and the cells, you know, they were a bit bigger, but the very nature of them could, you know, cause some fear and anxiety. So while Dr. Weissman did not conclude the existence of ghosts, he did find the data fascinating. It's it's interesting, right? It's interesting how one, you can do scientific experiments in a haunted location and measure the results, but yeah, no conclusion was was um, was brought about, uh, but it's interesting that these participants did have these experiences. So I would love to hear what you think. Do you think that Edinburgh Castle is haunted with all of the many hats it's worn in its, exi- in its existence? Did it collect spirits of some kind or did all of that trauma, um, I mean, literally Game of Thrones, the Black Dinner with, you know, the two Douglas boys. It's interesting. It's interesting how this all comes together. So I would love to hear what you think. If you've been to Edinburgh Castle, I'd love to hear your stories. Be sure to put them down in the comments. And that's it, everybody. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next round.